All right, good day to everybody. Welcome to another Daily Devotions. It is December 15th, and today we're looking at Paul's first letter to Timothy. Timothy, a young pastor in need of some guidance. Uh, six, uh, five chapters in all. Let me read from the introduction to the Wesley Study Bible. First Timothy is the longest of the three pastoral epistles, which are Second Timothy and Titus as well. And they're named because each is addressed uh, to individual pastors with an interest in building faithful congregations. All are attributed to Paul, even though they differ from his other letters in literary style and theological substance. Nonetheless, the ancient church including that included them in the New Testament because these differences completed rather than subverted Paul's witness to God's gospel. First Timothy combines personal exhortation with doctoral summaries uh, to guide an inexperienced but gifted pastor in ministry. This letter commends the congregation's accommodation of outsiders in order to dispel their negative suspicions of Christians and draw them ever closer to God for salvation. The letter refers to the church as the household of God to draw parallels between its internal practices, leadership, and relationships, and the urban Roman family. Paul locates the congregation then within and as integral to its cultural setting. While opposing, te uh, while opposing teachers teach different doctrines uh, and are contentious, Paul's primary concern is to impart practical advice to help Timothy form a faithful congregation, one that embodies God's purpose for creation and that aims at loving relations. Nothing could be closer to the core of Wesley's instruction than this. All right, so uh, just a couple of issues to highlight here so we can go through 1 Timothy. <coughs> um, Paul wants to warn against false teachers. Now, one of the things that happens to any movement over time is as the movement grows, it becomes more diverse. Uh, diversity is a good thing, um, but some diversity isn't. And so you've got some, uh, as time went on, time goes on and the church has grown, uh, you get uh, some people teaching some things that are not helpful, uh, perhaps teaching uh, things that go against the very central core doctrines of the faith. And so this is what Paul is warning about, um, uh, to, to be careful and to make sure. And by the way, part of that means that Timothy himself needs to be uh, well-versed in the gospel and the traditions he's being passed along to him and, of course, the scriptures. All right. Um, so one of the things First Timothy wants to talk about is qualification. Um, the first thing I want to talk about is women, uh, because at face value, it appears that Paul is uh, uh, promoting the submission of women. Uh, verse 11 of chapter 2, let a woman learn in silence with full submission. Verse 12, I permit no woman to teach or to have authority over a man. She is to keep silent. Now, <clears throat> of course, this has been taken to keep women out of ministry and in some churches even not allowing women to teach Sunday school. What I think Paul is doing here is an admonition for that current situation and not for all time. He is not laying down a rule for all time. If you uh, get verse 12, I permit no woman, the verb there in the Greek is in the present tense, meaning I currently permit no woman to teach. So we have to assume, because this is, by the way, because we know in other letters, Paul isn't that way. He refers to Junia and Romans as an apostle, he clearly is with Priscilla and Aquila, Priscilla being also someone in authority in the church. So you either have to conclude that Paul is just confused, but I think what's going on here is there's something happening in this congregation where Timothy is serving that leads him to, to tell women they need to sit on the back burner uh, for the time being and not teach. And we don't know what that situation is. Uh, we don't know what's happening, but this is not to be understood as a rule for all time. All right. You get qualifications of bishops, you get qualifications of deacons, and here's the important point. The point is people in leadership positions need to be people of character. They need to be upstanding people. They need to be people who can be trusted. They need to be people who uh, uh, are truthful uh, and people who exercise good integrity and sound judgment. And uh, anyone who cannot do that, doesn't matter how gifted they are, 
uh, doesn't matter what talents they may have and bring, if they can't, if, if they are not persons of character, now that doesn't mean they have to be perfect, obviously, but they need to be consistent, consistent people of consistently good character. If they can't do that, they can't lead. And so that is what these qualifications are about. Um, and I would also say that uh, when you get to the discussion of the widows, um, I think there's something else going on here with that. Uh, there's detailed instructions about widows, put them on the list to be cared for if they're over 60, if not, and, you know, um, they're going to, if, if they're younger, they may want to marry, and so they're going to uh, uh, violate their first pledge. This is not a reference to a second, a first marriage. Um, in Judaism, as in Christianity, uh, death releases a person from the marriage vow, so these are widows. Their husbands have died. They haven't been divorced. They have nothing else has gone on. They have, they have, their husbands have died. So they're free to remarry. The first pledge that I think Paul is referring to here is there seems to be a situation where widows can commit themselves to the ministry of the church in a special way. By the way, that shows women in leadership positions. Just let me note that. And so they pledge to do that and to honor Christ. Paul's concern is, is that they make that pledge to honor Christ, and then they meet some guy, and now they want to get, forget that when they pledge themselves and get married. Paul, Paul does not discourage women from getting married here. What he is saying is, be careful because younger women, you know, they may have other things in mind and may want to get married at some point, and that's okay. Nothing wrong with that, obviously, but be careful about having them commit themselves to the church in a way that the church will be let down because they meet somebody unexpected and they decide that they want, want to get married. Okay, so I think that's, that's important. Um, and in verse 17, you get uh, admonitions to elders, let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of a double honor. The elders are the pastors. The word here uh, in Greek for elder is presbyteros, where we get the word Presbyterian. And presbyteros literally means old man. Um, and so the elders, those who led the church, were the older, wiser ones. So that's why they're called presbyteros. We also translate that elders. And uh, just a little side note, we Methodists understand that. That's why I, I am an elder. You know, you, you do have some independent churches who have elders who are people in the church, right? They serve as elders and deacons. The way Methodists have historically interpreted this is that the elders are the clergy. The deacons of the clergy. So um, we're ordained elders or deacons. Elders are word, sacrament, and order, and we pastor churches. Deacons are word and order, and so they may have specific ministries to youth or to music or to something else. So elders here are the pastors, okay? Very important. Um, so, uh, and, and Paul ends uh, the letter by encouraging Timothy to fight the good fight in verse 11. Uh, as for you, he says, man of God, shun all things, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, goodness, gentleness is his character. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of, etern of the eternal life to which you were called and for which you made good confession in the presence of many witnesses. So again, <coughs> excuse me, a call to character. And this is important for Timothy if he is going to lead the church. Now, one of the things I want to end with this about 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus is that they are perfect examples of what John Wesley referred to as practical divinity. And that is theology on the ground. That theology is not just theoretical, but theology, our convictions are worked out in the life of the church and in its mission. So let me read to you from the Wesley Study Bible, a core term on practical divinity. Consistent with his Anglican tradition, uh, theology for John Wesley was practical divinity. Theology's purpose was to educate and equip Christian pastors and leaders to shepherd God's flock, the church. This means that a theologian's priority is to know, teach, and exemplify the gospel. Practical divinity occurs in sermons, public prayers, visitation of the sick and, and the poor, administration of the sacraments, and living in mutual accountability. The instructions to young Timothy in chapter 4 exemplify what practical divinity meant to, West, meant to Wesley. Here, the goodness of creation is not simply a theological doctrine, but implies the necessity of giving thanks to God at the dinner table. 
We are called not simply to study Christian convictions about God, but to train ourselves in godliness. We are to give attention to the public reading of scripture, to exhort, to exhorting, to teaching. Wesley's comment on this verse is apt. Enthusiasts observe this, expect no end without the means, okay? So in other words, theology should guide us in our mission and ministry to the church and in the world. Okay, that's 1 Timothy. Now tomorrow, 2 Timothy uh, purported to be Paul's last letter prior to his execution. Let's pray. Gracious God, may we be people of character this day. May you guide us uh, as we discharge our duties and our obligations uh, as followers of Jesus. And may we consider it all joy to serve you. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Hey, folks, hasta mañana.